just when you thought 2020 couldn't get any more bizarre. Oh my gosh. The Pentagon declassifying three videos of what they're calling unexplained aerial phenomena. Apparently, some United States senators have received an actual briefing on this UFO phenomenon. Earlier this week, the New York Times and Politico revealed the existence of a secret government program to investigate UFO sightings. Especially focused on encounters by members of the military. I'm Ralph Blumenthal. For 45 years, I was a reporter for the New York Times. In December 2017, two colleagues and I broke the story of the secret Pentagon program to investigate UFOs. The Navy has confirmed to us and so is the Department of Defense, that there are things flying around the skies that aren't ours and probably don't belong to the Russians or the Chinese. So then you'd have to ask yourself, well, who do they belong to? Most people know me because I was stationed on board the USS Princeton in 2004 during what's become known as the Nimitz Tic Tac incident. I'm Jason Turner. I was a Petty Officer Third Class on board the USS Princeton. We flew the E2C Hawkeye. We had the, the latest and greatest Hawkeye at the time. I was the officer of the deck on board the USS Princeton during certain watch rotations uh, when we encountered the Tic Tacs throughout that period of our workup in 04. It was basically a um, workup cycle preparing for our 2005 deployment. It was it was normal operations for the most part. You know, we man up the airplane, we put all our classified stuff in and we send it flying. Comes back, we catch it. Nothing out of the ordinary on our end until well after the fact. I'd been communicating with Kevin Day, the uh, senior chief radar operator down in the Combat Information Center to uh, coordinate us vectoring in on those anomalous contacts that Kevin had uh, locked on on radar. I was on the USS Princeton and I started to notice these really strange tracks up off the coast of Catalina Island. And the reason why I say they were strange because they were the, the first group I saw, I think there was probably five of them. And they were loosely, a real loose formation just going real slowly to the south, 100 knots, and they were at 28,000 feet. You know, I'm thinking to myself, I've I had 18 years of sea time behind that radar at that point, and I had never seen anything ever fly like that before. Usually things that high going that slow, they're going to fall out of the sky. I had the highest track quality possible the entire time. Weird, right? Well, get this. The videos were previously leaked by a private company founded by Blink-182 rocker Tom DeLonge. Now, this video you are seeing here is presented as possible evidence. It was captured by a U.S. Navy fighter jet in 2004 off the coast of California. If you look closely, it appears to show a whitish, whitish oval object about the size of a commercial airplane hovering over the ocean. What is it, what exactly? Is it exactly? It's a flying object, and we don't know what it is. I would hope somebody is checking it out. <laughs> I would hope there's a program of our Defense Department to make sure they do not pose a threat. And sure enough, that's what that program was. It just buzzed away. One of the things that uh, the ATIP program did was study videos that were taken by uh, fighter pilots uh, off the carrier Nimitz and also later the Theodore Roosevelt that recorded uh, encounters with anomalous objects. What made people interested in this is that it involved the Pentagon. Pentagon. And those videos, by the way, have been the most watched uh, videos that the Times has probably ever put up. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. Look at that thing. It's rotating. So all of these things came together on board the bridge of the, the Princeton. It was just unusual, the people that were where they were. Uh, whether it was Commander Fravor and his wingman, or Senior Chief Day, or Gary Voorhees, or Jason Turner, or other people that were paying attention, all of those people were exactly where they were at the time they needed to be to see what they saw. So several groups went by over the course of several days, and groups of five to ten at a time. I just remember um, a lot of unusual requests from Kevin, um, asking me to have my lookouts go out on the bridge wings, and and scan for air contacts when we weren't having an air exercise. And when the 14th of November rolled around, that's when I really got concerned because we were gonna do um, a pretty major air defense exercise. That's when I became concerned because now these objects were gonna be in the same airspace as my friendly aircraft. And, and Captain Smith comes down, he was air defense commander for the Nimitz tractor. He comes down to combat and said, hey, sir, you know, we've been tracking these objects and Nobody in the strike group knows what they are. In fact, we had 
we suspected a system malfunction at one point. So we brought our whole system down, ran diagnostics tests, brought it back up, and the objects were still there, even clearer now. The radar system was a phased array radar. It was it was working well with intolerance. As a matter of fact, it was working better than you could even expect it to work. And I, I told Captain Smith, I said, hey, sir, you know, um, I'm concerned about safety of flight. If we go up there and there's some sort of error, this happened. Somebody's going to ask you and me why we were so damn curious about these things. And I strongly recommend that we intercept one and see what it is. We picked the closest one and I got the, the comms up in the overhead speaker. And it's pretty standard to intercept. And he gets with he gets to the merge plot position, which is <clears throat> two objects in the same vertical piece of sky. And when now when you're looking at it on a two-dimensional display, it looks like one object now. It's called a merge plot. And as soon as he gets to that point, he goes, oh my God, oh my God, I'm engaged, I'm engaged. Right to the speaker, we're like, what? You know, last thing we were expecting. And that object dropped from 28,000 feet where he was down to the surface of the ocean. And I found out the next day, 0.78 seconds, less than a second. No sonic booms, no nothing. And, you know, he was a top gun pilot, so he very, very type A personality. So. He, he goes chasing it down to the surface and he gets down and he sees it go, moving around like a ping pong ball about 50 feet above the ocean, the thing, like a ping pong ball bouncing off the walls. And right underneath it, there's a big, huge disturbance in the water. And he, at one point, he actually calls over our, our um, call sign was Char Charlie's. Charlie, uh, we may have a der downed aircraft here. And so we start um, scrambling to launch our search and rescue procedures and all that stuff. But it, Thank God it turned out that it wasn't a down aircraft. And to this day, we don't know what that disturbance was. When that object left him, uh, Commander Fravor's intercept from the surface of the ocean, it went from where they were to that point in the sky was about 60 miles away at the time. It, it did it in less than two seconds. It went from where he was to his cap station in less than two seconds, 60 miles away. And how in the hell did that object know where his cap station was? <laughs> right on it, too. I mean, not close. Exactly on the Latin long, exactly at the assigned altitude. The Nimitz incident, a famous uh, example of this, which was well documented by multiple radars, multiple pilots in broad daylight, that vehicle demonstrated speeds in excess of 5,000 miles an hour it was able to hover a 50 feet above the ocean after descending from above 80,000 feet. So the pilots who are observing these craft are absolutely mystified, and that comes through clearly in their public statements. It had no wings, so you think, okay, it's a helicopter. Well, there's no rotor wash in the water, there's no rotors, and when helicopters move side to side, they kind of slow and then they pick up speed going the other way. This was extremely abrupt, like a ping pong ball bouncing off a wall. It would hit and go the other way and change directions at will. I mean, what the hell flies like that? And then the, the, the ability to hover over the water and then start a vertical climb from basically zero up towards about 12,000 feet and then accelerate in less than two seconds and disappear is mm -hmm. something I had never seen in my life. Getting uh, Fravo for the first time on the record talking about this at a time when you know, many of the pilots were afraid of um, retaliation. If they came out publicly, they were afraid for their careers, etc. I think was a real coup. Congressman Kucinich, I want to move to a different area because uh, yeah, right. this is a serious, a serious question. The godmother of your daughter, Shirley MacLaine, writes in her new book that you cited a UFO over her home in Washington State, that you found the encounter extremely moving, that it was a triangular craft, silent and hovering, that if you felt a connection to your heart and heard directions in your mind. Now, did you see a UFO? Uh, I, I did, and uh, the rest of the account, well, I, I didn't, I, it was unidentified flying object, okay? It's like, it's unidentified, I saw something. Well, so p people, I think, have conflated the concept of a UFO with whether we're visited by aliens. UFO means unidentified, flying object, <laughs> okay? This is a highly nonspecific term. Yeah. It is so nonspecific, it admits you don't know what you're looking at. But what's driving that thing if not a space alien? It's unidentified. These people were trusted to watch nuclear weapons for the United States. 
which is a pretty big responsibility. So if we're going to say they're not good witnesses, I find that hard to believe. And Dave Frabo is very courageous and a very good trained, you know, the best trained observer you can imagine, benefit of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of training. So he was a trained observer. So um, people like that, when they say they've seen these objects, uh, come with, you know, tremendous credibility. I mean, you have people that swear by it, right? And pilots have come in and they said, and these are pilots that are not pilots that are into that particular world. But we have had people saying that they've seen things. Uh, anyway, Fravor is a real hero. Commander Fravor, although he has a very important role in this by being one of the few pilots that got the up close and personal view of these things, the pilots that actually went up after him were the ones that were able to actually video it. Chad Underwood, who has gone public about a month ago now, um, is the one who had the follow-on flight to Fravor. Fravor returned, talked to Underwood, who's going out next, said, this is what we saw. Underwood said, hey, I'm going to go try and find it. He has stated he recorded a much longer video than what was released. And he's the one who recorded the very brief clip that was released. So in addition to the guy on the Princeton who saw the longer video, the pilot who took it has also said there's a longer video. It is frustrating so badly because clearly um, these little video vignettes that we got, um, and that's all they can really be called, they're just little slices of what has to be a longer video. That video then ended up on the Cypernet, which is a, a secret LAN uh, internet system for the military. It's, you know, super encrypted. You have to have special access to get it. And and uh, on that, we were able to actually see this video that was, you know, a, a much clearer, much longer video. I got to see the full unedited version of the uh, Tic Tac video. The things that you missed that were kind of important is actually seeing it do like right turns in the frame or seeing it actually move in, in the way, like as it would get closer to the object, watch it, you know, it might go out of frame, but then all of a sudden, right before it goes out of frame, you see it take a right turn or a left turn where it was a right angle turn, you know, not a, not just a veering turn. It starts from point A and then goes to point B at one speed. So it'll start here and go here. It's like it has its own mind. Like I'm going to go this fast to this point and then stops. It, it gives you a true feeling of exactly why these pilots felt compelled to come out and talk about it. To get something going that fast and stopping that fast and redirecting that fast, it would, it would literally rip your guts out. It's moving that fast. You hear the voices of, of pilots uh, talking about uh, uh, how excited they were to see this object, which was accelerating like nothing they'd ever seen before. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, look at that, man. Look at that fly. And it's the excitement in their voices that makes them so, makes the, the video really so authentic. The media tends to look at this like there's just been these three videos, that there was no discussion of UFOs ever in history until the New York Times in 2017 published those uh, that article and talked about those videos. And so people are now saying, well, you know, those videos, they could represent something else. Maybe China or Russia has hop skipped over us in the technology front because they're looking at only three videos. But the truth is those videos should be the doorway to the larger context of hundreds of excellent cases and thousands of pretty good cases. I was convinced, I mean, we're looking at something non-Newtonian here, non-conventional. I really want to see these with my own eyes. So a couple of days later, I was up on watching. There was another group airborne, so I, again, I picked the closest one, got the relative bearing in the range from the ship, ran up to the bridge wing where the big eye binoculars are, and I, I actually spotted it in the, in the sky. It was, uh, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes or an hour after sunset. And honestly, Brian, I was disappointed because for, for me, I was, I was a boring white light. So I watched it for a few minutes and disappointed, I went back down to combat. I, I wanted to do something cool, you know, when I was looking at it. One of my skill sets as an operations specialist is to be able to correlate radar data with visual data. And I was an expert at doing that, so I, I knew what I was looking for. And it was definitely the same object that I had seen on the radar because it was the only thing in the sky right there. And it was it just it was just moving really, really slow. And it was a, 
a dull white light. And for me, it was kind of disappointing. <laughs> and, you know, Sean Cahill, you interviewed him. He was actually a bridge watch standard. And during the course of the two weeks when this was going on, um, I was getting called up to combat all the time. You should have heard it. Every time they showed up, I got called, called up to combat. And he apparently did see these things maneuver through the big eye binoculars in uh, pretty astonishing ways. I saw five to seven stars move counterclockwise toward a center point, and each of them start blinking out. I mean, what the hell flies like that? They weren't multicolored. Um, they were white. They weren't. Uh, they weren't dazzling. They were. They were fixed brightness. Um, there were no navigational lights. There was no strobing. I, I was flabbergasted. I turned to the to the lookout next to me and I, I said, "Did you see that?" And we we used saltier language, but I said, "Did you see that?" And he opened mouths and just nodded, "Yes, chief." And I went back inside. I walked over to the other bridge wing. And I think I just kind of went in and went on the bridge and just kind of contemplated what I saw. And that was it. Um, there we talked about it a little bit in the chief's mess. Uh, Kevin and I certainly talked about it. I know Gary had told me that he had uh, he had went outside the skin of the ship at some point and and looked at it through the big eyes, which are literally a, a giant set of binoculars, and that he got a very good look at it. When I thought that I could just barely maybe see him through the big eyes, I'd always try to get up there and go look at him. And I figured at night I'd have a better shot. So the first time I first time I really got to see any of them were at night, and they would just look like white dots on the horizon because they were so far away the first night. And then just seeing a white light and then just seeing it just disappear and move to a different point in the horizon and do it in such a fast method and move in such a odd way. It's odd how it moves because it moves so fast that although your brain registers it moved, it took you, it would take you a second to actually realize what had happened it was just amazing that they were actually real you know it's like just like you it's just like when you're just looking at them on a screen you know they're not real to you you know they're there you believe they're there but to actually know for a fact they were there and they just witnessed something that's probably they're never going to witness again in their life i have to be honest that, that that evening changed my life you know given all this you can see why i was so frustrated no one seemed to care <laughs> This, this had happened. I, I just didn't understand it. To this day, I don't understand it. It seems like something happened that wasn't normal, and um, <clears throat> it freaked out a lot of people, as it should. I think this is a national security imperative. We have clear things that we do not understand how they work operating in areas that we can't control. If we were off the coast of, say, Iran, and this happened to us, and we were in a wartime situation, this could really pop off something severe, you know, because if it's if it's uh, entering the airspace around our ships and we don't know who they are, why they're here, and you go to engage this thing, think about how easy it would be to start a conflict simply based on that. The, the day that the Princeton took control of uh, Fravor's fighters and a couple of the other fighters. The Hawkeye that was airborne, I launched, I sent it flying, I recovered it, I took all our stuff off. Not in any of the reports that have been done, um, the Tic Tac object actually formed up with the Hawkeye. And they could see it right out their windows. I don't know the exact distance, but it wasn't far. They saw the same appendages coming out of the bottom of it. They saw the same fighter-sized tic-tac shape that everybody else has. If it got that close, we got a lot of information about it. A bunch of separate flight stylers with their, their own eyeballs. Um, and apparently the Hawkeye crew did too. Apparently one of the objects one of the objects joined with them and then flew right down to the side of, the, of their aircraft. And they describe it as a, as a tic-tac. The same thing that Commander Spray saw. And one of the other little known or little reported facts is one of the guys I worked with, um, we had an enlisted guy who would go flying with the airplane to test and fix stuff that we couldn't do on, on deck because um, some stuff only worked when it was up in the air. And he happened to be on that flight. They were debriefed in a skiff, which is a centralized um, information facility, basically a room where you can't hear anything inside it, you can't hear anything outside of it, it's where you discuss classified stuff. They signed non-disclosure agreements, and they were told, 
what happened is what happened, and that's all you can say. It's just unfair, outright, not to, not to put it in the hands of the overall scientific community. I know for a fact, it's a commonly disputed item that nothing was recorded. There was a whole lot of stuff recorded because I hit the record button myself. When the plane that was airborne during the initial in intercept with Fravor and the follow-on came back, took all our, uh, they kept a, the plane on deck uh, running for a few extra minutes, longer than they normally do. Uh, basically, the crew was told not to shut down. Then the crew shut down, and they hightailed it out of there. Still not all that abnormal to us. So I went in, grab all our uh, classified hard drives and everything else in the airplane that I have to do. Take it downstairs into our work center, put it in the shop. And as far as I was concerned, I was done until the next time I had to be up on deck to man up another airplane. Um, about 20 minutes or so after we got back, there's a knock on our work center door. Um, it's my commanding officer and two Air Force officers. So he asked for the, the hard drives, the RMCs. Um, and the plane normally carries six of them, so he wanted all six of them. So I start to uh, you know, sign them out in our logbook because we trace where they all go. And he stops me, which is abnormal. Basically he said, you're just giving them to me and we're taking them. Basically, he, he took those hard drives, he took those officers, they were gone, never saw them again. And an airman who worked at Nellis at a radar installation says he and his fellow servicemen watched over a period of five nights unusual objects flying over the Groom Mountains. He says the radar images indicate the object zoomed into range at speeds of 7,000 miles per hour and then would stop on a dime and that nothing we have is capable of doing that. The airman says that when word of his sighting got out, he was ordered to turn off his radar sensors for that area and told to keep quiet about the matter because it did not happen. I saw two guys get off uh, khakis, polo shirts, could have been Jake from State Farm. At a certain point, I was requested to come down and to a, to a space uh, that we own, and in that space, uh, they're just like, all right, we need all the, all the data recording tapes that you have available. I'm like, all right, you know, so I had to get up, get up to go up to the computer room, track them all down, and I'll be honest, I thought about not giving them all but when it comes down to it, you get caught doing that that's leavenworth you know that's that's jail time so just to the fear of that kind of reprimand i i did give all the tapes that we had they had him wipe a lot of data um he, they were they had him erase blank tapes just so they had a time stamp on them they took a bunch of his data exactly what combination of data was taken you'd have to ask him all of our data recording that uh was available was given to them and then we were also requested to go to any of the tapes that we had that were blank whether they were brand new or not and literally erase them it's just and and that was mostly just so that it would have a time stamp on it it would have been mostly spy one bravo data uh it would have been the the tracks but it's going to be all raw data what was set to record was radar data so all the radar tracks that popped up on the screen would be recorded. All the ESM, which is um, it's a passive system, basically records electronic signals. All those were recorded. Our CEC system, which is a uh, very fancy data link between us, the Nimitz, the Princeton, and some ground stations was recorded. So through that system, we would have seen everything the Princeton saw, seen everything the Nimitz saw, seen everything ground stations saw, so there was a lot of data coming through that alone. And then we had several other um, data links that were tied into the fighters that we would have also seen what they saw. Plus some stuff I can't tell you about. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of information that can be taken from that data that somebody has. Um, and with the, with the recent FOIA request that went public, I firmly believe, just based on what data I know is there, that a lot of that data was probably used to make the briefing. I, I can't reveal anything. Oh, really? <laughs> because President Clinton said he did go right in, and he did check, and there was nothing. Well, you know, that's, that's what we're instructed to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key here, is like, where is this stuff? They have it, but where? You know, who's got it? Why are they not? showing the whole video of what I saw. Uh, some of this information is very highly compartmentalized, and uh, I don't want to go too deeply into this, but uh, 
I think um, um, it's still information is being held very carefully uh, uh, in certain offices. Uh, certainly, a tip was uh, highly secretive. Its origins lie before 2007. It's been in the government, embedded, you know, in the government in some form or other before that time. Do you think you'd know if there were evidence of extraterrestrials? Well, I think my great, our great pilots would know. Uh, and some of them really see things that are a little bit different than in the past. So I don't think uh, it's, it's easily uh, accessible, uh, even by, you know, even by presidents. While you could have gone to the Princeton and got a bunch of information, and they did because they took the Princeton stuff as well, while they could have done that, while they could have gone to the Nimitz itself, the most amount of information they could have taken came from the Hawkeye. But the Air Force is traditionally always the ones researching this kind of stuff. So for them to be involved is not all that abnormal. Like I said, the, the Air Force flight suits stand out. There's a drastic difference between the insignia on an Air Force uniform and a Navy flight suit. So they were definitely wear. I couldn't tell you anything else about them at this point. But they were definitely wearing Air Force uniforms. So. Yes, we, we did get that story when we interviewed them. Uh, again, there wasn't an opportunity to go into all that. It's a very strange episode. Um, we don't know what it what it means. It could suggest that uh, uh, somebody was aware of, of uh, uh, some some entity or office or agency was aware of, of, of these encounters and wanted to preserve the record or that they were equally puzzled and wanted to see for themselves. It was really never clear. Uh, you know, what that signified, and that was one of the reasons we didn't really go into it. We couldn't make much of it. If that's our technology, or if it's not our technology, it needs to be, because that is, in, it's incredible. My hunch is that, that it was not our, us, that it was not a test, because, I, you know, I used to design and execute and debrief training scenarios and uh, air defense exercises for a living. And those things are, um, if I could describe how that's done in one word, it would be safety. So for another agency to put a test on top of my exercise that actually places my aircraft in some kind of danger, that's illegal. And you could actually go to jail for that. That's really not how you test things. And, I mean, it, it's possible. I mean, someone maybe did make that decision. I wouldn't want to be the person that did, though, because it, um, that's just not how we do exercises. Kevin, you know, he's he's hard on that. You know, he doesn't think the government would go against and uh, you know do anything illegal to test this stuff. But I'm, I, to be honest, with you, that's about one of the few points that we don't agree with. I think that they would pretty much do whatever they want as long as they didn't. They weren't going to be held accountable for it. It's it's pretty amazing to me that we can have as many credible accounts of our encounter, similar encounters, uh, you know, uh, other military personnel, trained aviation, you know, uh, personnel, pilots, uh, all over the world. I, I don't think it was our stuff. We've been very careful uh, in our reporting uh, not to, you know, jump to conclusions. We're often asked, you know, well, doesn't this point to an extraterrestrial uh, presence? And, you know, the, the answer is, you know, we don't know. It could be anything. I think at this point, it's very important just to compile the evidence and uh, see where the evidence takes us. At the end of the day, I'm the skeptic of the bunch. I want to believe that it's ours or, you know, and it, it's, it's hard. It's, it questions, it makes me question things because, like, you have this idea of what reality is. And then this happens. And then it just blows your mind. And now I question everything. The way that we reacted on board that ship left me cold. This seemed like the most significant sighting that I could have imagined. I personally don't believe that it would have been possible in 2004 for any entity of the United States government that we are aware of, let alone a foreign entity from another government, or even a, even a conglomerate of uh, of major multinational corporations. We've since broken down how fast we believe it was going, some of the ways that it operated. And, and, and frankly, that's, 
I, I would throw to Lou on that. A stunning claim from the man who ran the Defense Department's multi-million dollar UFO program, a top secret operation that was for years dedicated to, yes, investigating UFO sightings. There is very compelling evidence that we, uh, we may not be alone. I cannot wrap my head around how we could have in 04 gotten to the point where where we had moved that far forward um, in physics, in metallurgy, um, in every, everything that we've speculated would go along with making a tic-tac move. I can't see how that would have been us. Every single one of these objects, all hundred of them, they all faded from my radar, disappeared off radar, right above Guadalupe Island off the coast of Mexico. Right before we had gotten underway for that exercise, our ship had received a top secret upgrade to our system. I didn't even know about it because I only had a secret clearance. I didn't have the need to know. Um, it's my contention that that um, system upgrade suddenly allowed us to see something that had always been there. And that also kind of explains, at least to my mind, why since 2004, a lot of other Navy units have been seeing these things too, because not everyone has this technology on their ships and aircraft. At one point, these things were falling out of the sky like this, choo, 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 choo. all going from 28,000 feet down to the surface of the ocean in less than a second. They'd get chased by our guys, and then they'd go right back up to 28,000 feet, go right back to 100 knots, and keep tracking south towards Mexico, as if they wanted nothing to do with us. What if it is real, because I think it's real, because I saw it, um, and what if there's more of these, and what if we do nothing? If you look for Montana UFOs, 1956, I think there's a video on YouTube of it, and they actually look like the Tic Tacs, and they fly past a, uh, a radio tower, and uh, the government actually investigated it. So, I mean, that's in the 50s. That's when, you know, the height of this stuff that was, that was happening. I tend to think... Um, we don't know, even the secret levels of our government don't really get it yet. You know, they've captured some things, kind of like when another country captures one of our drones and start taking it apart, uh, probably trying to reverse engineer it. But as far as flying it around to the point where we're flying around our own jets, I, I just don't, I don't know. I, I don't, to me, that doesn't make sense. I'm also on the fence exactly of what these things are, whether they're reverse engineered or whether it was like, because uh, I've had other ideas like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, technology cartels like the diamond cartels uh, and oil cartels. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a very easy task for us to really figure out what these things are, are, are doing or why they're here or if it's us or something, somebody or something else. I mean, frankly, I lean towards it being our technology just based on some things I know and some things I kind of am guessing at, but I'm equally open to it being a UAP or something else. But if it was our technology and somebody wanted to test that technology, the Nimitz strike group was the top of the line at that time. Between the fighters, the software, the systems, the ships, you didn't get any better than us in 2004. So if I was going to test, I'm throwing it at the best we have. And we would have known, the data would have said if it was more than likely if it was ours or not, based on all the electronic signals it could have gotten from the object. It could have gotten, you know, frequencies, all kinds of other stuff. It's the toy that was in the airplane that I can't talk about that I think would have drawn the most data from that object. I call it a toy. Um, we were the only asset in the Navy that had it. Um, and it wasn't even routine for us to have it. It was some classified gear that we periodically put in the airplane and took with us. Like I said, what it does and what it can't. I've signed my own NDAs for that program. I can't actually share what it is or I would love to, but I can't. It could have told, we would have known if it was transmitting or if it was receiving data, if it was receiving stuff. So there's a lot of data there that we could have learned quite a bit about it. This is the part that chills me a little bit because, listen, I, I want to know before I'm, I'm gone, but I make, I, I think that it is a complex 
thing that we are in the middle of and it challenges possibly the very nature of reality. I think it was the actual object or actual technology, that it was AI, artificial intelligence, which made, made it seem like it was alive, you know, lifelike behaviors, and that would result of the artificial intelligence probably. But I'm not gonna discount the possibility that these were actual um, living entities of some, of some kind. If it was our technology, the generational leap in you know, just like what we know about physics alone would make us have to relearn everything. Why now, right? Why, why are they showing up now? My theory on that is, as far as we can look in space, all we see is barren rock. Light years away, all we can see is barren rock, except for us. <laughs> we live on some pretty precious real estate, don't we? It's really valuable. And assuming there are, there are other civilizations that know about us. I don't think they're gonna let us destroy this place. Either through nuclear war or global warming or anything like that. My guess, because at this point, that's all any of us can really do, is that somebody knows what's going on, whether it's a UAP or our tech. Somebody, I'm gonna say in the Pentagon, for, for lack of a better term, knows what's going on. There is no behind the scenes Here's what it is. I can't point at cognizant authority that can say what it was. Everyone that I know that I would turn to says we don't know. Says that it was anomalous um, and that it, it maneuvered in a manner that we are unable to maneuver our craft. That it was definitely solid. It showed up on radar. Um, we have it on, on the visual spectrum. We have it on the uh, in the infrared portion of the spectrum. Um, so we know that a physical object was there and we have radar return data that this physical object moved in a manner that fits, um, the five observables that, that Mr. Elizondo and, uh, the ATIP team developed. We, we know there's physical evidence. Granted, we'll probably never see it, but we know it's there. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've got highly trained naval aviators all saying what they saw. You've got highly trained enlisted guys all saying what we saw and in a big picture if you put everything together it all fits if you take everyone's perspective from where they were at the time when all this went down and i sat here and just kind of analyzed what everybody was saying you know and i'm like wow this really paints like this whole picture of what was happening throughout history nobody's been able to get to the actual witnesses our ability to um find and get these pilots to talk to us, uh, I think is a major part of why the story had the traction it did. And there's so much consistency between the stories that are being said to people. Again, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And to, to have all of these stories matching from different perspectives, that's going to be very, very hard to do and remain consistent. Still want to make that ID, man. You know, my job was to ID everything that flew in the sky. This was the only thing in my entire career I was never able to ID. And I still want to. I want to be the guy that makes that ID. I look at it as a, a seminal event. When the history of the UFO cover-up and the uh, subsequent disclosure is written, it will be a pivotal point in that history. <laughs> this is one of the first events they've ever said, yeah, it happened, we don't know what it is. So that's the only big difference between this case and a lot of others, is the government actually said, yeah, it happened, no, we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm.